Recently I've been very interested in these physics simulation videos, but the other day I came across one in particular by the channel Pez's work, where he basically just simulated a bunch of colliding particles in 2D. And I don't know if it was the elegant math, or just the really beautiful presentation, but I was blown away. So I did what any normal person would do, and implemented a completely 3D version using Python and my good old friend ChatGPT. Fast forward and I quickly realized that Python was not going to cut it. No matter how many optimizations and different algorithms I tried, I just couldn't get more than a few hundred particles on the screen, while Pez is over here with, what was it? A hundred thousand, are you serious? Something had to be done. So today, we're going to build the whole thing again, in pure C, and my hope is that you'll leave this video with a slightly better intuition around computer simulation, and maybe even some inspiration for your next project. The simplest way to represent movement is to calculate the ball's displacement over a set time interval and add that to its current position. We can then do the exact same process to update the ball's velocity, and voila, we have the Euler approach. This method is extremely simple and super fast, but it's not the most accurate, so small errors will compound when we do our simulation. How can we do better? Well, to answer that, let's go back a bit to Sir Isaac Newton's kinematic equation, which some of you may recognize from physics class. This equation relates an object's current position to an initial position, velocity, acceleration, commonly forgotten jerk, and so on. Now here's where things get interesting. I've left some more thorough resources in the description, but with a little calculus and math wizardry, we arrive at a new equation. You'll quickly notice that velocity is nowhere to be found. Instead, we keep track of only the ball's current position, previous position, and acceleration. Something else you'll notice is this last error term, representing the difference between a realistic value and our approximated value. For reference, the Euler method had a quadratic error term, so this is a welcomed improvement. This is known as Verlet integration, and is the whole point of this video. Translating this approach into code is quite simple. We create a new class and keep track of these three values for each Verlet object. I've also added in a radius value which we'll need for collisions and later rendering the particles. The update method is exactly the same as the formula, but written in the most obscure C code possible because how else would you do it? Let's go ahead and build our simulation and see what happens. The balls are able to move predictably from frame to frame, and I've even added a simple distance check to keep them all confined in this shell. If I add a few more balls to our simulation, however, we can tell something's not quite right. We don't have any collision detection, so there's nothing to keep them from passing right through each other. The good news is, this really isn't too bad when working with only spheres. Let's look at an example with just two circles. All we have to do is compute the distance between their centers, and make sure this value is always greater than the sum of their radii. If this separation ever becomes too small, we just give each sphere a little nudge and push them apart. Here's what that looks like in code. And now we have collisions. Ah, much better. I've also added an attractive force when I press on the keyboard to give some more interesting behavior. I could do this all day. While our simulation works just fine for a handful of particles, it doesn't perform so well when we begin to add more. The first problem is that our collision detection algorithm checks every particle against every other particle, even if they're miles apart from each other. The second problem actually has nothing to do with our simulation, but rather how I'm drawing each sphere, as an independent object every single frame. Let's start by addressing the collision problem, as there are certainly more than a few ways to go about collision optimization. I tried out a few implementations I found online, like this one for KD trees, but they didn't make any significant improvements, so I scrapped them early on. A technique that did work, however, was making use of our scene's coordinate system, 
Every particle keeps track of its position, so we can use that knowledge to skip testing against other particles that aren't even in the same neighborhood. Intuitively, we can overlay a grid on our simulation to see how this works. For every cell in our grid, we compare all the particles inside that cell against themselves as well as any neighboring cells. This means that a lone particle in the corner won't waste time checking for collisions against the others, while a particle in a dense cluster will know which ones to prioritize. Let's go ahead and run the simulation. Nice, we were able to double our count up to 2,000 particles. Now let's move on to the other problem. As it stands, if there are 100 particles in our simulation, every frame we're sending 100 packets of model data to the GPU and making 100 separate draw calls. We can see this issue more clearly if we stop running the particles entirely and watch our simulation speed up. The constant communication between our program on the CPU and rendering on the GPU is indeed the bottleneck. But luckily we're not the first person to tackle this issue. A better solution is to pack all the position data into a single array and send that to the GPU once per frame, along with a single instance of our model data. And boom, we have everything we need to render the scene. This technique is known as instance rendering, and with that we can render over 8,000 particles simultaneously. While we're here, I'll cover one more optimization, which lends itself very nicely to the grid algorithm we covered before. Because the order of comparisons is not sequential, and each cell can check its neighbors more or less on its own, we can divide and conquer to speed things up. Rather than having one piece of code iterate over the entire grid, we make a batch of worker threads, each responsible for its own section. In a perfect world, if our collision algorithm takes 5 milliseconds to run, and we use 5 worker threads, we should be able to get through the whole thing in just 1 millisecond, so fingers crossed this should help. And there we have it, 11,000 particles and still running at 60 FPS. The reason we're not getting better results is because some other issue is now bottlenecking our performance, but I'm pretty happy with this nonetheless. There are certainly still a million optimizations and bugs left to implement, but those will have to wait for a future video. For now, I want to take our base simulation and see what else we can make with it. A pretty straightforward effect we can add is to color the particles based on some attribute like their velocity. If we open up our fragment shader, the GPU program responsible for coloring each pixel, we can add a few lines to achieve this effect. First, we establish the two colors we want to interpolate between, in this case, a light blue and then a dark red. Whoops, let me remove that. We then calculate a t-value using the particle's velocity and then clamping that between 0 and 1. Finally, we mix between the blue and red color based on that t-value. This means slow-moving particles will be closer to blue and faster ones will be closer to red. Something else I want to try is adding links between the particles to create cool structures. For this, I'm going back to the Python version because it's much easier to prototype in than C, and we really don't need that many particles anyway. To add a link between any two particles, we just have to keep their centers a constant distance away from each other, and we can use the same math we used in the collision algorithm. Here's what the code looks like. And I was extremely excited when this worked perfectly on the first attempt. But my troubles really began when trying to render the links. Clearly I was not understanding how to orient or rotate things in 3D space, something we didn't have to worry about with the spheres. Luckily I found a linear algebra book at the thrift store and it had everything I needed. Change of basis anyone? Something else I found interesting was that I only specified I wanted these four particles to be equidistant from each other, and they figured out how to make that happen on their own. They seem to have settled on a tetrahedral structure, just like you might have seen in chemistry. Looking back through these commit messages requires no explanation. Let's check this one out. Back to linking particles. 
We can also make more complicated structures like icospheres, which make use of a recursive division to specify how many vertices you want. Here's the base model with just 12 vertices. We can then divide all the faces into four subtriangles and project them onto a sphere, and now we have more vertices. Pretty neat. If I don't do anything but link the particles together, everything will just collapse on itself. Luckily, we have the ideal gas law to keep our structures inflated. We calculate the center of all of our particles and then exert the appropriate outward pressure. We can also build a trampoline out of the particles by arranging them into a grid with links between neighbors. Don't forget to fix those corners in place. And lastly, here are some other random creations I came up with. Well, that's all for today. There's obviously still lots more to explore with Verlet integration, and entire games have been based on this simple physics, so definitely check out the links below if you're curious. I actually started this project over a year ago, and just never got around to making a video. So, if you found it interesting, or at least entertaining, feel free to drop a like or comment below. Cheers!